Oh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series. Uh, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, uh, we would like to acknowledge the Turtle and Yagata people as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. And we recognise their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. It's my great pleasure today to welcome Professor Kevin Galvin of the University of Newcastle, where he is the Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Enabling Coefficient Beneficiation of Minerals. Kevin's a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and previous recipient of numerous awards, including the Ian Walk Medal, the ATSC Clooney's Ross Award, and the Antoine Godin Award in Mineral Processing. Kevin is also the inventor of the reflux classifier, which is used in gravity separation for fine mineral particles. With over 240 installations around the world, the technology has been used to beneficiate iron ore, mineral sands, metallurgical coal, potash, chromium, lithium, and other base metal oxides. His presentation today is entitled Beneficiation Using RC Technology. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Galvin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, the drivers for achieving uh, reductions in uh, carbon uh, and, re re sorry, the, the, the drivers for achieving net zero emissions is what I'm really trying to say, that globally significant challenge is very much uh, supported and underpinned by our field of mineral beneficiation. I mean, if you look at um, the metals that we need, and we need lots of metals, you, you dig all out of the ground, the first thing you've got to do is recover and concentrate that material ahead of any downstream processing. And if you don't, we, we know the consequences. You know, emissions are going to just go through, through the roof. But the challenges that we have, uh, you know, are growing exponentially. And, you know, I, I think one of the messages I've got here today really is that we, we should begin to try to question what we do. You know, uh, we, our field is very much sitting in a bit of a paradigm, in my opinion, a 50 to 100 year old paradigm in, in the way we think. Uh, so much of what we do do, you know, it's perhaps because we've always done it that way. We, we ought to, and I, I just want to encourage students in particular to question things. Uh, and hopefully maybe I can challenge a few notions here today. All right, well, this um, slide shows inclined settling, which very much underpins uh, the operation of a reflux classifier. And if I just um, run the video, you can see the particles settling and then you tilt the tube and then you get this rapid segregation. Now, uh, if you've got the particles actually, or the, the suspension moving upwards, uh, you, you start to see these particles depositing onto the incline and settling down and others moving through. When you locate that above uh, an upward current fluidized bed, then you have a, a reflux classifier. Now, it is a technology platform, and uh, I will be talking predominantly about a fine gravity separation today, but there are other versions. So if we locate the reflux classifier horizontally in a spinning centrifuge, okay, we get these G forces. Uh, this is what we call the graviton, which is something that we're developing with our collaborator, Ethel Schmidt. Uh, and I th and I and that ultimately is about desliming and desliming very very efficiently uh, at particle sizes of around ten microns as the objective, and that I think can become a real enabler for solving so many of the issues in the industry, particularly around um, in iron ore in particular. Uh, Josh Starrett was up here, I think, a couple of weeks ago talking about um, size classification. I'll touch on that just briefly. Um, coarse particle flotation, I know, is an area of interest uh, in this area. And 
Uh, I want to talk about a sort of a diagnostic algorithm that uh, we've been working on. The reflux flotation cell, uh, it, it's a gravity concentrator. You, you know, if, if you turn the reflux classifier upside down, you get a device for separating particles which are uh, less dense than water, like air bubbles. So I'm going to be focusing mainly on the fine gravity and the coarse particle flotation. Now, I want to go back to sort of the, the 101 of minerals processing. And there's a myriad of um, circuits, really, that um, one could present. And um, so it's a, this is a bit of a paradigm, I think. We take the material from the mill, it goes into what we call a rougher. So we give things a name. And of course, you don't have to think too hard about it. You just want to make sure you don't lose anything along the way. You didn't get the grade that you wanted, so maybe we take it to the cleaner. If you're still not satisfied with the grade, we'll go to a new device called the recleaner. Um, and maybe you get to the concentrate grade that you're after. And along the way, there are middling streams. And okay, it does make sense to capture those and there's maybe slimes in there. We can use an upward current classifier. And, uh, you know, we can then recycle things back. And as long as we've got a way for the, the fines to get out and the course to get out, ultimately, it'll work itself out. Um, and I think there are spiral circuits these days going to five stages, seven, nine. Uh, you know, is... In terms of the challenges going forward uh, in this century, and, that, and that's the thing, the, the challenges are going exponentially. Is this going to be fit for purpose in the long run in the 21st century? Uh, we've always becoming finer uh, and perhaps um, yeah, more complex and uh, in terms of mineralogy and so forth. You've got a very large circulating load. The processing rates of the individual units may not be particularly high, and um, you've got material moving through one system into another, into another. Okay, so this is an example of process intensification where we have three stages of spirals and an upward current classifier, which was replaced by one reflux classifier. So higher grade means a higher price and there's higher recovery. And out of those two comes uh, a very rapid payback. Much of the, um, the world's iron ore is processed um, through reverse cationic flotation. And again, you, you can see uh, the flotation, there'll be the roughers, the cleaners, the scavengers, recleaners and so forth. And of course, you've got to drive your circuit to achieve that recovery and that grade. I mean, that's what you're trying uh, to do. Uh, I'll come back to this slide a little bit later on. But because first I just want to talk about gravity uh, concentration. And I want to go right back to the basics. Uh, the proposition's a very simple one. You're putting particles into water and they settle. And they will settle at a rate that depends on both their size and their density. And you know, you can calculate the numbers. Uh, and I've picked a particular lutriation velocity of 0.02 meters per second. <clears throat> so to the right, the particles are faster settling. They'll fall to the underflow. To the left, uh, slower settling. And the, the point is, you're not separating them on the basis of density. Okay. So that, that, that is the core challenge of gravity concentration. How do you go from you know, a situation like this to separating on the basis of density? You've got to bring something in to play. Uh, boundary conditions, geometry. Now, this is, uh, this is a great experiment um, uh, by King and Layton. And this is the paper, and it's concerned with the... Uh, inertial lift of a sphere in a shear field. So what you've got is a rotating plate at the base. 
and the plate at the top doesn't rotate. And so we develop uh, pure shear, a fixed shear rate through the fluid. The red particle you see there is positively buoyant, so it's pressing up against the plate, achieving mechanical contact. And uh, here's some results in a dimensionless form. So you've got to understand how this is made dimensionless, but the data points that are looking horizontal are uh, these ones here. They're associated with the particle being in mechanical contact. So the resistance is through friction and through a lubrication type force. That lubrication force is governed by the gap between the particle and the plane, and the gap is controlled by the surface roughness. So as you build, and so the, the bottom axis is a Reynolds number, which is the shear Reynolds number squared relative to the sedimentation Reynolds number. So as you build the shear rate, what happens is the lift force grows, it increases, but it doesn't manifest anything until a critical point, it's critical. It's not gonna manifest any change until the lift force exceeds the buoyant weight force. Then it, the particle will move away from the plane, create a bigger gap. That means that the resistance is purely hydrodynamic now, and the sphere can adopt much higher velocities, and you can see the data points move away uh, hydrodynamically. So you can identify precisely the critical point for lift. Okay, so this is a key experiment that was done in our lab uh, too long ago, uh, 2008, and it's an elutriator. So in the form of a reflux classifier. This was extreme at the time, it's routine now, but uh, the plates are a meter long. The gap between the plates is 1.8 uh, millimeters. Uh, we'd been using gaps of 60 millimeters, even on a full scale machine, 120 millimeters. Because you start off not knowing uh, what it should be. And um, so we're interested in the separation size. Okay, so as a function of velocity. So you can see nothing unusual here. The separation size is increasing as we increase the fluid velocity. And the next data point I can assure you was anticipated, it was long anticipated. Uh, but until it actually happened, would it happen? It was that kind of a, a moment. Uh, and we got critical lift. So the separation size, um, basically it led to particles of virtually any size going at once. Now we were able to describe those results theoretically. Now the, the data points were published in 2009 with a first attempt of theory, uh, but we came, we came across the King and Leighton work and we're able to do it, uh, do a much better job. This theory involved not one adjustable parameter. Now you might say, well, you got lucky, uh, but we had two other data sets at the time and applied exactly the same theory, no adjustable parameters. And you can see the features in the data. So the sharp point is the discontinuity at which the lift occurs. And you can see the nose in that curve, particularly at the high density end, I thought was quite, quite remarkable. Now compare that with natural settling, where you cannot really separate on density. You can see that we're developing a bit of a basis here for uh, a density-based separator. So this was a, a, uh, a really important point in the development of this technology, because we got the arrival of a new force. The force was always there, it was just never big enough to manifest movement of low density particles off the incline to go with the flow. And this, this, is, this is the sum total of that theory. Uh, you've got a velocity field, which is very simple. It's a parabola. Uh, you differentiate that, you get a, a shear rate. Again, very simple. We've got a lift force directly out of the work of King and Leighton adapted to our geometry, which is operating in the normal direction to the incline. Uh, 
and it competes with the weight force in the normal direction, Fn. And you can also see uh, in the schematic that the positioning of a large particle is more into the flow and therefore exposed to higher velocities than the positioning of a smaller particle. So that also diminishes the effects of particle size. Okay, what you're looking at here is the top of a, an RC3000 unit. It's an iron ore operation in Northern Europe. Very turbulent looking, as you can see, but that's in the launder. So you get a sense of the flow that's going, going on here. But within the channels, it's laminar. Why is it laminar? Because the channel spacing is probably around six millimeters, very closely spaced. And you get an idea of just how laminar. So throughout, you know, a device that's meters by meters in uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 cubic meters or probably 20 cubic meters, this one, uh, within a one millimeter cube of space, you could pretty well nail what the forces are acting on the particles in every part of that system. So I want to now move on to the process intensification in the beneficiation of iron ore and, and make the point that because they see the autopilots in a says, oh, we want to process down to towards below 20 microns. It's got to be flotation because the mindset says, well, uh, gravity separations perhaps at best good down to 75 microns. Okay. But if you can get the selectivity you're after through density, why would you bother with flotation? Of course, it depends on how fine you need to go as well. So, you know, here's the comminution circuit, and you've got a classifier there. And the first thing they do with these itaborite ores, okay, so they're largely like a hematite silicate laid material, which is and liberates very nicely. You put in nearly a thousand um, desliming cyclones to cut at 20 microns. So you've immediately lost some of your iron ore. Uh, then it's the reverse cationic flotation. So cationic flotation is probably not so good for the environment compared to the anionics. Uh, rougher, cleaner, recleaner, scavenger. By the time you assemble all of this, you're down to as little as three tonnes per square metre per hour net processing rate. The uh, material that comes out as product is dilute. So we need product thickeners. Your target is about 67% FE. And certainly that's going to be the trend for iron ore to be able to get to high grades. Now, high grades are essential uh, if we're going to decarbonize the iron and steel industry, which is perhaps a good 8% of global emissions. Um, and it's very hard to get to these sorts of grades. 69.9 is pure hematite. Right, so that's your reference point. 67 is getting uh, very high indeed. So we uh, we put the question to Vale. Um, you know, we, we asked, we basically asked the question, you know, could we uh, get rid of um, the product thickener, flotation, the desliming cyclones, the chemical plant, and use a single stage separator? Obviously, you still need your tailings storage operations, but the pulp density that can come from this could be 60 or 70% solids, so you don't need the product thickener. Could this work? So they, they sent a, a sample and we, we had a go at it and maybe we got lucky, but I, probably within the first one or two tests. So this was the feed and there's a good bit of material below 20 microns. And you you can see that to get good recovery, you do need to get beyond the 20 micron mark. Uh, these were the operating conditions. So we were using, in fact, very closely spaced channels, uh, 1.8 millimetres, which sounds crazy, um, but I believe uh, there may even be a unit on, on site right now with those channel spacings. Uh, nearly 10 tonnes per square metre per hour. And yeah, so one of the very early results was a uh, 67% grade. And this has been published just recently. And in fact, in this paper, they're looking at magnetics as well. 
the magnetics will give you 64, 65, but not much more. You've got a problem. We combined it with a reflux classifier. We could take the magnetics to 68 and a half, but there's a loss of recovery. Uh, so, okay, let's peg it back to 67. And what we found was, yes, the recovery increased significantly, but the combined recovery was the same recovery as what we would have got if we just used the RC on its own. So the RC is very much a single stage uh, type of separator. Okay, so then they said, well, let's have a let's undergo take a program of work. And they sent us an ore, which was actually a little bit more challenging than that one, I have to say. So we, we noticed the difference. And, and maybe this is really where, where the main game is going to sit. Um, okay. All right. Now, before you undertake some sort of program of work, particularly where you're evaluating a steady state separator, um, I mean, you do work in a laboratory to try and take control of the errors. Uh, and Josh Starrett might have spoken about uh, what we do in our lab to address the variability over time in the feed. You cannot produce a homogeneous mixing state is our conclusion. And once you accept that, you've got some chance of addressing the issue. So I won't go into all of that. I'll just give you an example, though, of how or the extent to which we've been able to manage that. So this is a manganese ore, by the way. So uh, we've got the size and the grade distributions. And after 90 minutes, okay, then 160 minutes, the rate of change of the numbers, it, the, the, the grade is the, the key one because that grade could go up to 40, 50% or down to zero. The density variations could be almost anything. To hold that position and out to 260 minutes means that we're driving the system towards steady state and we can drive a, a complete mass balance. Okay, uh, for the itaborite ore, uh, obviously a little bit easier because it's finer. And you can see the kind of consistency over time that we can supply feed to the separator. Okay, um, well, here's the results of uh, one of the runs. And I thought, let's at least show you what the material looks like. Um, and you've got the different grades across the top. Uh, we're, we're covering from 20 microns through to 250 microns in those images. So we've got a bit of work to do to get the 69.9. And you can see this, the grades coming through uh, very close to 69 at those finer sizes in one stage at that throughput. The problem end is over on the left. This is really the key because at these coarser sizes, the silicates are falling through and joining the product underflow. Right? Our goal is to send them the other way, almost to defy gravity. And you recall the shear-induced inertial lift that I talked to you about before, right? So by, by pushing the flow rate, right, you increase that shear rate significantly in those narrow channels that lifts those coarse particles and pulls them away. So I'll comment a bit more on that in a minute. And you can see the, um, the very low grades in the reject stream. So this, this is um, work as a collaboration with... Um, Armando Rodriguez from Vale, and uh, this paper was only accepted this week. Okay, now to give you a bit of an idea of what's going on, if you have a look at the, the black uh, data points there at 10 tonnes per square metre per hour, probably should have uh, recorded on the graph the flow rates because it's more about the flow rate. Uh, in the device, it was six litres a minute. Um, the next curve down was at four litres a minute, and the one below is at two litres a minute. You can see dramatic shifts in grade. So what's going on? We've got a higher feed rate, and we're getting arguably a better separation. And you can see over here, we've got the uh, silica partition curve, really, and at very low feed flow rates of two litres per minute, we're getting a lot of silicates joining the product underflow. That's what's killing the grade. Uh, we increase the flow rate through the 10 litres a minute, 
it's producing that lift, it's sending these coarser silicates over the top and, and the curve drops. Now, in this work, we, we covered a lot of territory. So you, you're seeing the effects of feed rate. Uh, we changed feed pulp density. And our interest there was in trying to increase the solid throughput. 10 tonnes per square metre per hour is great. If we get to 15 or 20, that'd be great. Now, the as received feed pulp density carries some viscosity, and this is something you have to always be aware of, but not too bad, not too bad at 26% solids. When we took it to 36% solids, it was a, an absolute disaster in terms of um, grade and recovery. Because the thing about viscosity, as opposed to just increasing the volume fraction of the solids, which is somewhat more linear, the thing about viscosity is it's exponential. It's like a switch. It just switches the process off. Um, going, dropping the pulp density is the other thing we did. We went down to 16% solids. So we knew we had a bit of a viscosity issue. We dropped the pulp density of the feed, and the viscosity in the background behind the particles is now closer to water. And, we, and that's where we got the uh, highest level of performance when we removed the viscosity effect. So the combination of a higher flow rate with that extra, or uh, well, that reduction in the viscosity, which is not a lot, um, led to by far the, the best performance. Now, other parameters we looked at was the channel spacing at three millimeters and 1.8. The three millimeter channel spacing was pretty good. Um, we also looked at things like fluidization rate and set points. So we got all these things going on and you get a whole lot of data. I mean, how do you get your head around this and pull it all together into something that makes some sense? How do you tie it all together? Okay. And um, no doubt there are multiple ways to do things. Uh, let me just explain what we did. So we went back to a paper from 2020 uh, where we did some work on some chromite, uh, 38 to 300 microns. So it'd been fully de-slimed, so we had no viscosity issue. So we're, we're on the, on, you've got to benchmark a lot of this stuff to a, a negligible viscosity issue. In other words, viscosity is like water. The partition curves are shown here, and I guess, um, most of you would be familiar with the concept of a partition curve, which is effectively the probability of a particle, in this case, going to the underflow product. So if we take the coarsest particles, 212 to 300 microns, okay, they're going to the product underflow with very high probability, and certainly when the particle density is high. Uh, as we move towards finer particles, the probability is decreasing. The other thing about the curve is what we call the D50, which is about 3,200 for the coarse particles, crossed to these finer particles of 4,300. So we, we are interested in how the D50 varies with particle size. The, so we've used this dimensionless expression. N may well be some universal constant, let's say. We've got an S0 and a D0. S0 is totally arbitrary. So we set that at 300 microns, which left one adjustable parameter here. It's like a, it's like a set point. It um, raises and lowers the partition surface. Okay, so that, that's basically what it does. The, once we've got the D50 versus particle size, we can use this Whiten equation. And that leaves one unknown here, which is the EP. Now, the EP is effectively the error in the separation density. And you can think of it as a little bit like the slope of these curves, perhaps between the 25 and 75 percentile. And what's interesting in this case is that the slope is pretty well constant across the full range. Now, that's unusual. In work that we've done previously, that EP climbs exponentially as particle size decreases. Uh, we're using a channel spacing in this system, which is three millimeters, which probably eliminates a lot of mixing or dispersion and mixing. 
we hadn't seen this before. This was the first time we'd seen it, uh, that the EP was almost independent. The data set was really expensive to get, by the way, you know, twenty or $30,000 sink float, very high densities. You've got to have the right material. You don't want it all low density and high density. You've got to have some distributed material. And we were not entirely happy with the outcome here. You, know, the, you can see some scatter and some uncertainty in the numbers. Uh, it was the best that we could do at the time. It's all, and we just wanted to get a sense of where does that partition curve sit? So coming into the current project, that's what we've got. We're not entirely sure that it is going to tell us what's going on. Okay. So um, out of that work, the N value was 0 0.28 and the EP, 330. Okay. So let's have a look at how we proceeded. Now, this etaborite ore, you can, you can pretty well get away of treating it as a binary system. We did tweak it a little bit. Um, so what we've got are is our partition framework. And our fixed values became an Fe203. We nom nominated a density of 5100. There are mineralogy issues. This is not pure hematite. Okay, there is some gerfite in there. So we put 5100 as the particle density. The SEI2, um, 2600. We also included in every particle of silica, 2% iron reflecting the mineralogy. But we could run it as a binary problem. So the whole problem now reduces down to three parameters. Uh, there's the value of N. We, we don't know much about it. 0.28 we got in one paper. So let's explore how that changes. D naught, uh, that's effectively raises and lowers the partition surface. The EP almost pivots off the D50 versus size curve, being vertical or, or whatever. I, I look upon those three as almost orthogonal, um, whether they are or they're not. Uh, I mean, N is almost a measure of how broad of size range you can apply. Because if N's large, it's going exponential and you're only really separating over a small range. So you're getting a stretch in the size range through changing N. D naught, you're lifting, and EP, you're pivoting, if you like. So we did a curve fit. Um, we had the data on the FE grade, iron grade versus particle size. We had the um, recovery as a function of particle size. We could integrate under all of that to get the head grade and the head recovery across all experiments. And we just let the Microsoft solver do the rest. Okay. So to give you a sense of the parameters, the D naught was fixed across the board in these particular graphs. So the N was about the right number, in fact, 0 0.27. What I've done here is it increased the EP to 600. And you can see that the red curve which is from the partition surface, has fallen well below the data because that's what the EP is about. It's less efficient. You're getting lower grades and lower recoveries. And clearly it's not EP equal to 600. Let's, um, let's bring the EP back to 362, but increase the N value. And you can see the separation, the range of the separation is restricted now. It's not pushing out to... 20 microns or 10 microns. It's quite clear that the N value should be a whole lot lower. And, and finally, the, you know, this is the, if you like, the curve fit on that particular run. You might say, well, the last data point doesn't look terribly good, but that's an insignificant quantity of material of that particle size in the problem anyway. So we're not at all phased by that. But across 13 separate experiments, this approach was applied. So this is what the partition curve looked like for that, that particular run. And you can see uh, that below 100 microns, there's little or no silica joining the underflow. And that's why we're getting those really high grades. So we get very full closure of partition curves in the RC. Uh, and, and so we're getting very, very clean material there and then gradually less clean. 
So there's the surface and there's the numbers. And the interesting thing was the EP we got to was 362, not too far off the chromite. And this is for the low viscosity case where we close to the viscosity of water, uh, the end value very close to the chromite work for that particular case. But the, the most important result from my point of view was that the value of N across all of the experiments, or at least 12 of them, one outlier, and there's a reason for it, was 0.27 with a standard deviation of 0.82. So we can now call that almost a constant in the problem. Uh, in other words, we can now reduce the whole problem down to two parameters, at least for this system, for this geometry, which is the D naught and the EP. So, for, so we could change the feed. This is a feed independent approach. We can change the feed, you know, new assays as uh, a function of particle size. We can distribute the iron ore into different size fractions and just calculate a grade recovery curve now. And this has been calculated here by just changing D naught for a fixed EP. That EP was the best EP we got. So this is the best that we can hope for based on what we know. And you can see some of the data points there. And we've done a more recent experiment that pushes to higher grade and lower recovery, very close to that curve. We can do a sensitivity analysis around 600. And these are the cases that had EPs reasonably close to 600. So you can get that sort of sensitivity, but but you can apply it much more broadly. So we've got a much tighter sense of what's going on across what would otherwise be a really very complex uh, problem. Still got a bit of time for the, the next bit. So quickly on size classification, I just want to mention one point as an epilogue to Josh's talk. So, um, and I've run this video. So that's his experiment. And um, you can see the flows coming out of there. It's quite laminar between the channels. Um, it's quite a production when we run these experiments, lots of people involved. Uh, these are some of his classification curves. And he was pushing up to coarser sizes and, and met with a bit of an issue. And we introduced a geometry change, which solved that problem. But interestingly, uh, since, since that talk, uh, we've discovered a new problem. Now, all of this work was done with a channel spacing of nine millimeters. You say, well, why nine millimeters? Well, we wanted to switch off the shear induced lift force, right? Uh, if we were down around three, we would have had this lift force carrying all this silica over, uh, not doing a size based separation. It'd be like a density based separation. So, nine millimeters switches it off. But as we're pushing up to higher and higher flows, even nine millimeters is not the right channel spacing. So his next experiment will be 15 millimeters channel spacing. That should switch that effect off and we'll see. So we want to be able to maintain this uh, separation performance. The next topic is coarse particle flotation. And you know I don't really regard this as a rougher per se, because your goal is to do the best separation you can in a single stage. It's got a definite purpose, and as we know, which is about rejecting gang material at coarser sizes. And there are uh, some existing technologies, certainly the Aries Hydrofloat, it's been around for a good 20 years. There's a Nova cell. And look on the back of an, yet another fluidized bed. Uh, and we've been working with F.L. Schmidt for a number of years on this called Corsair. Now, uh, what we have here is a um, the product concentrate and the underflow um, uh, reject, if you like. The you can see a little bit of contrast. You know, on, on a on a proper photograph, you you get that sense of a more metallic look in the product, uh, much duller look in the underflow reject. So you have to use your imagination a little bit on the PowerPoint. But if you look really closely, you'll see. Uh, you'll see a particle in the product that doesn't have much surface liberation. You say, gee, that was pretty good. Um, people have done well there. You look down below, oh, but there's a particle down there with a little bit of surface liberation. What happened there? So we ask the question, you know, and really comes down to, well, look, if you've got a particular particle, what's the probability 
of it landing in the product or the reject. Uh, it's a probability game. You can't just sort of look at a pile of particles. You can pick it up and it's fully liberated on the reverse side, right? So X-ray CT scanning would look like a great candidate. We did send our samples to Salt Lake City, um, had too much magnetite. So th there are some issues with that approach, um, but ultimately we'll pick a material where we can get that validation out of the algorithm that we've been working on. This is um, uh, very much the work of, um, uh, well, Crompton, Islam, um, and myself, uh, and we've got another student coming, coming in. Uh, so Luke Crompton's PhD. And, you know, here we've got a separation with a lousy recovery of 36% at 400 microns. Now, is that a reflection of the technology or of the liberation? Um, here's the cumulative result, which looks a lot better, maybe 83% copper recovery, uh, maybe a 58% gang rejection. But um, so what we did was we sampled the feed, the product, and the reject. And remember what I said earlier about driving experiments with no or little or no variability in the feed. So our ability to get uh, consistent, steady-state samples was important here. So we got the feed, the product, and reject. We put them into a mechanical cell, and we looked at the uh, kinetics of the flotation of each of those samples. So what we're plotting here is the proportion of hydrophobic material as a function of time. Well, you find out how much hydrophobic material you've got by floating everything, There'd be little or no entrainment here because we're only doing it on the 90 to 500 micron fraction. And the Corsair runs on the full size range because it's got all of this internal classification that allows it to, to handle a supplied feed. And this is showing the data over a much broader range. And that's supported by the kinetic description. So this is very much in the spirit of uh, Rongi et al, who have applied kinetics, rate constants, in a material balance across a circuit. We're doing it across a single separator for the purpose of getting a partition curve. And we've used four rate constants. Maybe we could have got away with three, and we're looking at those issues. So in terms of the mass balance for the fast floating material, you can see we've got 76 mass units coming in, 74 mass units going to product, uh, 2.8 to reject. We've got a 96% partition number there. We can go to K2, whoops, K2, 75%, K3, 25%. We use a reverse approach. We want the partition numbers to be on the, the interesting part of the partition curve. We don't want them all around 90%. We use a reverse approach to get to the rate constants that will deliver those partition numbers. And so we find the point in the kinetics where those rate constants occur. Okay, so you get the idea, partition number versus a rate constant. If we now normalize that with respect to the maximum rate constant, hopefully we get uh, a result that's independent of the mechanical cell that we're using for the diagnostic, because we want the result to reflect the coarse particle flotation machine. Now, this is sort of motivated by this work by Wellsby et al, uh, and particularly this plot by Jamison, looking at the normalized rate constants as a function of surface liberation. See, the data collapse there suggests to us that uh, a normalized rate constant could be a useful proxy for surface liberation. Okay, so if we, Look at the 50 percentile position. The particle has an equal probability of reporting to product or to reject, the K50, K0.06. It's putting us down here on the curve. I'm not suggesting this represents a form of validation. I'm just illustrating the concept because the real work is really happening now and back in our lab. And because our coarse air system is a lot of work, we've got to grind 300 kilograms of ore, uh, do the separation. We said, 
let's forget that. Let's just do it all around a mechanical cell. Right? We can we can go through a whole lot more experiments. We can look at robustness in the algorithm. We can improve the algorithm and try and understand what it's telling us. So there's the mech cell. Um, and what you're looking at there is three curves. Uh, the, the top curve is for the feed, which is this dash curve. So we have an A and a B sample. They're meant to be the same. And so we run the flotation right out fully for the A sample. Then we um, run the B sample. And so we run the B sample for a finite period of time, in this case, three minutes. We could pick two minutes. That's a residence time issue. And you can see if we draw the horizontal line back to the axis, uh, then what's left in the cell, we can start the clock again and look at the kinetics of the so-called reject left behind. And we can take the product that was produced, which is the black curve, uh, the concentrate, and look at its kinetics as a function of time. And in principle, the feed equals the product plus the reject, hence the algorithm, hence the partition curve. But the, this approach allows us to do a number of things. So, for example, we might be interested in different methods of crushing. So maybe that will show up in the partition curve. We might be interested in different ways of delivering re reagent to the particles that might uh, cause some spreading of the oils across the surface to anchor the particles better to air bubbles. Um, and you could actually even evaluate some of these things quickly in a mechanical cell. Now, the, we're interested in also relating this to uh, continuous steady state throughput considerations. So the height of the cell to the lip is about 12 centimetres. The time was 180 seconds, three minutes. And H over T is a measure of the plug flow throughput. So we've couple of, published a couple of papers on this just sort of recently re relating the batch to the multi-stage steady state system. But it's suggesting a, a throughput of 0.067 centimetres a second, which probably explains why you wouldn't use a mechanical cell in the first place in coarse particle flotation, kinetically slow. But I'll come back to that later if there's any questions. But um, just to give you a sense of what we're doing, we're trying to nail this to a post. We're trying to nail the uncertainties uh, the, and sometimes you've got to do things in extremes to get to where you want, right? So you see there's a lot of buckets. We have thousands of buckets in our laboratory. And um, what we're using is a riffle to split to create an A and a B. In fact, um, here's a video of Tariq, um, originally from University of Queensland. And so we're, we're doing lots of cuts, just using a riffle. The water is saturated with nitrogen. So we try and eliminate the time factor. So we create, create an A and a B sample, but then we take the A sample and put it back through the riffle. We create a new A and a B. It goes through about four levels. And that's why there's so many buckets there. And then we recombine them back in an alternate sequence to get back to an A and a B. So the idea is that the particles in one bucket are the same, well, ideally as the particles in the neighboring bucket because I was thinking about what Tim said to me about this flotation study that was done with uh, maybe 100 experiments to look at the inherent variability. And I thought, oh, I think most of the variability is in the particles that are going into a particular test. Anyway, we'll see. Um, so we've, we've done eight runs. We're still sort of improving our methods. Um, here's the analysis of eight runs. That's actually 16 samples. Uh, these are the partition curves, which have come together fairly close together, quite independent experiments. We wanted to get better than this. So the next round will be, uh, will double the quantity in the cell. We think that the variability is due to the low amount of hydrophobic material that remained in the, in the system uh, at that three minute mark. And we can also change the time. Anyway, if we take the average of the eight, that's the 90 to 500 micron size range, 
we've got that K50 there, a K max. The important one is the K, K50 over K max, 0 0.03. That's the important one. And you can see there's an imperfection of 1.2. YH is a hydrophobic yield. And so in the data above, you can see it's pretty well 89 plus or minus one. Then interestingly, the, the 90 to the 180 size fraction, we've got a K50 and a K max. The ratio came out at 0 0.033. The next size fraction came out at 0 0.033. And the final size fraction came out at 0 0.033. I would say there's an error of about 10% because the overall was 0 0.030. But we're almost getting this sort of universal curve for everything here. And we, we've given some thoughts about exactly what does this mean. Uh, if you had perfect breakage and you had a whole lot of uh, your material in the fast floating area, um, perhaps most of your material in the fast floating area and very little beyond that, we think you'd still get the same curve. Um, so we're, we're exploring. So we're, we're just making it up as we go, you might say. But it's, it's turning into an interesting framework at this point. So I'll just bring the talk to a conclusion. So I mentioned about roughers, cleaners, scavengers, which is a wonderful concept. It's ingrained in the DNA of the mineral processor, okay? Been very good in the past. It will continue to be used, but it will lead to sort of an increasing footprint and complexity. We should, shouldn't automatically always operate that way. The RC technology platform is pretty much a one-stage approach. It is, uh, I would argue, uh, uh, an alternative to cationic reverse flotation, as we are seeing. And just on the coarse particle flotation, uh, I talked about the partition curve using or utilising the flotation rate constant as a, a proxy. Uh, it's really about making the diagnostic accessible. Everyone's got a mechanical cell. You can do it the same day as your separation. And it's about the performance of the technology more so than the performance of the metallurgy. And I'd just like to conclude and acknowledge and thank uh, uh, Vale and also F.L. Schmidt that support, supported some of this work. Uh, obviously, the Australian Research Council for the centre. Uh, collaboration with Armando R Rodriguez of Vale, and other contributions directly from the group. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I'll remind the people online, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box or raise your hand in the chat and you can ask the question live. Uh, do we have any questions? Great talk, Kevin. Thank you so much. And it's very refreshing to hear about uh, classification and physical methods of processing. I'm reminded of uh, Peter Munro's comment, known to many of us of many years ago, who said that uh, any process that's not flotation can't be all bad. So sorry about that, Lisa. Um, I had a, a, a couple of questions about the reflux classifier part of your talk. First one was the N parameter. I, I just wonder, is that possibly telling you something about the hydrodynamic regime, the particle, uh, uh, you know, what's going on in terms of laminar or, 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 or um, turbulent flow? Look, I'm, I'm sure there's some good science behind the N, as there often is good science behind N values, um, such as Richardson and Zaki, even. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so uh, look, the N is absolutely in the hydrodynamics. It's in the shear-induced inertial lift, very much so. Um, and I guess with one of the things we're looking to do in the size separation, where, where, we're, damp, where we are removing that sort of lift force, switching it off almost, is to see what kind of partition surface we have in size classification because I would expect the end value to be much larger. Uh, my second quick question is, you, you referred in passing to the difficulty that we all face in trying to do get partition curves for density separations at high densities. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute uh, yeah. devil. 
Um, did I read somewhere, or is it a thought that the RC under certain circumstances, because it's such a precise separator, could actually be considered itself as an analytical tool in that respect? Uh, look, there is no, to my mind, there's no better standard than dense liquids, personally, although the whole issue of density is a complex one, particularly if you've got porosity issues and so forth, you know. What, what have you got left when the liquid moves into the particle? Um, but um, I, I have uh, read a paper uh, by another group, I think from Corium, uh, that talked about uh, how the RC did approach or that appear to be similar to sink float and similar to tables uh, down to quite fine sizes. Um, and, and certainly, um, We've used some LST in some of that work, which is because it's been a binary system, we can get a pretty good cut uh, for that material just using LST. And um, But the problem, of course, is what do you do with the material uh, below 38 microns with the clays and everything else? So we, we rely on a water-based approach there. But the, but the, um, the RC is, uh, if we're doing... Uh, batch separations, it's fairly ordinary. Continuous set steady state brings it right up close to that, that sink float result. We uh, have a live question online now. Um, uh, Mohammed, um, please go ahead. Make... Hello? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Uh... Thank you for your presentation. I just want to know, do you have any idea about the, uh, any variations of uh, reagents consumption or no? For example, collectors, uh, it's very important, you know. Thank you very much. Well, I think with the coarse particle flotation work, um, uh, we've just, we haven't sort of been focused on uh, reagent uh, per se. We, we've just used a fairly stock standard approach that we've used across other work. Uh, with the gravity separation, we don't use reagents. Thanks for the talk, Kevin. I really enjoyed that. Um, just from a plant perspective, six millimetres is a really small gap and 1.8 millimetres is tiny. Yeah. Um, so do the operations have serious wear problems and problems with the classifiers blocking up and how do they deal with it? I'm just going to say I'm pleased you asked the question, but I don't want um, that as a, a lingering thought. Um, and in fact, um, one of the reasons why it took so long to move towards those sort of channel spaces was for those precise concerns. Um, then the industry, uh, the technology took off after that work and globally six millimetres was the adopted standard. Now, we did some dis uh, discrete element modelling of this process at one point uh, with a two-dimensional version, okay? And the two-dimensional modelling predicted the system would block because, but the reality is in planar channels, parallel planar channels, Particles in the way, they just go around each other. And as soon as we did the discrete element modeling in three dimensions, it all worked again. Uh, and we, we see this in the lab all the time. We know that it's worked around the world with the six millimeters. You can always make something fail if you try hard enough. Um, now, as we go to three millimeters, right, uh, we've been engaged with a particular company in the manganese area. We did work in our lab. Uh, they were interested to install new units. And we said, I don't think you necessarily need new units. What you need is three millimeter channels. So we embarked upon the work. Uh, and the conclusion out of the work was, you know, perhaps you could achieve a 25, 30% increase in productivity. Uh, but to get them to move to put the new plates in was such a mindset right uh, and fl schmidt installed pilot unit out there 
In fact, they didn't install one, they installed two. One was six millimetres and one was three millimetres. And of course, with the variability on, on site, you know, it, just knowing whether something's improved something or not is really hard to do at, yeah, at a reduced scale. And um, well, the only thing I've heard is uh, they're pretty, pretty excited about it. Uh, and so the whole issue of the blockage is, is probably the way we would visualize what would happen with conduit, right? If you've got conduit, absolutely. Um, now, you go a step further to 1.8 millimeters. In fact, the word got back that they wanted to put 1.8 millimeters in. So they're hardly worried about three millimeter now. Um, and it's, it's in the feed preparation. But even if you've got oversized particles, we know that they will just fall like rocks. They're not going, going in there unless they're neutrally buoyant or something. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's counterintuitive. In fact, you get a cleaning effect from the extra shear rate. In fact, when we first put I think, 120 millimetre plates in, right, well, guess what? You packed out that much, created a gap this much, which was the shear rate that just kept it alive. So, um, so with the narrow ones, you are actually utilising the space fully. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Okay. My apologies to the outstanding questions online. I'll pass them on to Kevin uh, to answer uh, uh, later on. Um, but uh, I'd like you all to join with me in thanking Professor Kevin Galvin for his talk.